All right, welcome back. In the second part of the video, I'm gonna talk about how we can really harness the power of Bayesian statistics through generative modeling. And for me, generative models are a very natural way to think about structuring a problem, but often the way that this is expressed is not as direct. Um, for example, in a linear regression model, we don't usually think about it in terms of uh, a generative approach. Uh, but the example that we have here, I think, will really nicely highlight how you can map a concept from the real world where you have some knowledge about how the data was generated and then map that to a statistical Bayesian model and how we can then invert that using Bayes' formula and get to our posteriors. So specifically, what we're going to cover in this video is how to build these generative models that take into account knowledge we have about the data generation process then apply Bayes' formula backwards to get to the hidden causes, how to model time-varying processes, and how to iteratively improve a model. If you remember from the first part of the video, we concluded with the fact that the model that we built did not allow for any time-varying uh, variability. And here we want to address this now and build a much more plausible model of RT, um, which is the time-changing reproduction factor of COVID-19. The model that I will be building up towards is actually the model that is used uh, on the website rt.live. And if you don't know this website, um, it is a um, essentially a dashboard for looking at what the current um, uh, the current reproduction rates are for COVID-19 uh, across all U.S. states. Um, so here you can basically see how this works. And this website was built using, or the models are implemented in PyMC3 by Kevin Sistrom and Tom Vladek. And um, so this updates every day and the model runs and, and you get these nice lines out of it. And I think it's one of the best models out there if you compare it even with models from the CDC or the Robert Koch Institute in Germany uh, because it models a lot of the different aspects of what we know about how we get to symptom cases, which is what we observe, of course, there is a lot of a long cascade before we actually get to a positive test, right? So first you have to get infected. Once you're infected, you need to, um, there's first the incubation period, and then you develop symptomatology, and then you maybe get a test at some point, and there's the delay there. So there's all these different things that are delays that we need to incorporate if we want to infer reproduction rate, right? we have to know that there is this built-in delay. And that is what we want to, the model that we want to build up to. So everyone knows R0, which is just the base reproduction factor of a disease, which is basically if you don't do anything, how fast does it spread? If that's two, that means every day it's going to double. For COVID-19, it's believed to be around 1.3. So every three days, it doubles. and However, this is not really a quantity that is all that interesting because we do have things like lockdowns, social distancing, masks, all of those affect the reproduction factor. And that is what we really want to track, how, does the ch how that changes over time. Do you get this uh, reproduction factor out of the SIR, Susceptible Infected Recovered Model? And that, in fact, is how the model of the website rt.live started. Uh, but actually, this model that we, I will be building is not using an SRR model, but instead is just a much more direct, actually, and has um, a few assumptions, I would argue, about how this works. And that allows us to make it a little bit more hackable and uh, adapt to the very specific cases we have here. Okay. So here, now we again have our data. And one important change, so now we're going to deal with data from the yes. One important change we're going to do is we're not going to look at cumulative cases. So these are just now the new cases that we observe every day um, in the yes. And now we want to build a, basically a um, generative model. And we want to do this by writing it down in terms of a recursive function. And what we want to say is that the number of newly infected patients, yt, is 
function of the previous day's values times the reproduction rate, R0. And we will build upon this, but let's just say we don't assume any changes in the spread characteristics, right? So there's no social distancing. This is just the static model, basically what we had before, but now expressed in a different way. And here I'm just going to show how this model looks like in Python. So we have the number of, we're just going to simulate 10 days. We're going to have a counter. We're going to set R0 to be 2. And then we just here start with one infected on day 0. And then for every previous day, we just follow the math. We take the previous day of infectants times how many were infected anew. So times 2, because every day it doubles. And then we get this function here. And basically what we've done is we just recreated our exponential model from before. So this is, gives rise to an exponential model. It's just um, expressed uh, differently. Now we want to build this model in PyMC3. And as you can see here, so we could just build an exponential model, but we want to build the model like this just in order to be able to add more complexity and layer that in. Here we have a loop and the most important thing now for us is actually to map that loop into a PyMC3 object. And this is actually a little bit um, non-intuitive because we can't really have a loop in uh, PyMC3 because it's a graph-based framework. It works on Theano. And we need to um, use a different construct to create this loop. And as I said, PyMC3 is built on Theano, which is a graph library, where we have to create a graph that contains a graph operator, uh, sorry, a loop operator. And we do this with um, a function called theano.scan. But before I go into that, let's just start with our usual thing. So this is definitely a much more advanced model that we're going to build here. So the previous one was introductory. Now we're going to take things up uh, a level. The reproduction factor, which is what we want to estimate, um, we're going to use a, um, a log normal distribution because we know that it's only going to be positive. And then we define a seed population, which is how many people start in the beginning to have that. And then we create a vector for our y's. And we set the first value we have set subtensor, the first value to our C distribution. So this is what we're going to start with. And now we want to basically make that loop and uh, recursively um, have the next day be a function of the previous day times the reproduction factor that we want to estimate. And we're doing this via this Theano scan function. I'm not going to go into too much detail just because it is a little bit confusing. Uh, but really, um, just think about this as a standard for loop with some conditions. And the body of the for loop is what I put into the function argument. So this is lambda function. There's three parameters, the time, the previous days, y, and the r0. And then we're just going to say, oh, sorry, this is uh, the whole vector. And then we're going to say, OK, set on day t, which is the current day, this to um, the sum of all previous y's times the reproduction rate. And then we pass in some more values, um, which I'm not going to go into. But basically, uh, these just are the inputs then to this um, to this function. And they're going to they're, they're essentially the arguments that I'm going to pass in here, right? So this is just uh, t. So for every day, this is the um, the y that we're going to fill and the non sequences and how many steps we want to take. Now. Um, here we do some just some bookkeeping, so we are just interested in the number of infections. Um, the output here is um, has multiple outputs, so I just need to take the last one. Again, don't worry about this. This is a technicality. Really, we're just now getting um, an array of the values following this formula in this function. And here, I'm applying a trick um, where, because it's an exponential function, we very easily get values that are just extreme, right? So we, when, while the sample is trying different parameter values, it might run into something which just 
completely overblows. And then actually we get a problem with our negative binomial function. If we pass in values too big in here, it will blow up and give me a NAN or some error and the sampler will crash. So one easy thing you can do in that case is to just clip the values and say, okay, if infections is um, should be no smaller than zero, that has no effect because it's bounded to be positive, and no larger than 10 million. So I just picked high value that I know this won't blow up. And then I have the negative binomial function just like before. And again, now we're just following our Bayesian workflow. The first thing is we do, we want to sample from the prior predictive. And so here we're doing this, and we see, okay, well, we built an exponential model, so obviously we will get exponential functions. And we get, um, and here I've just plotted the data that we have. So obviously this is not going to be a good model, right? But this is just our first iteration of this model, and we want to keep improving this now. So, but nonetheless, like the outputs are as expected, and they're sort of on the range uh, of, if, of this, so it's not completely terrible. Now I'm going to sample this, um, so it's fairly quickly. Um, we're going to look at the posterior trace, um, and then we're going to sample the posterior predictive as well. Um, and now we want to improve the model a little bit. right? So we discussed, well, R0 is really not what we're interested in. We know that that is changing over time. So now we're going to multiply, not by R0, but by the effective reproduction rate at time t. So now this is a function of t, and that allows it that represents the fact that we can change it over time. Now, again, to illustrate this in just usual code, I'm building now RT as a vector, not a scalar as before, where I just say, okay, on the first day, the reproduction rate is two, and then over the next n days, it scales down to one. So this is just um, to simulate what that looks like. And now I have to change this formula to where instead of R0, I'm just multiplying by RT on day t. And this is what that looks like for these starting conditions. You can see, okay, it's going up, and but it slows down, right? And this could represent the fact that people are social, social distancing. Now, let's build this model. And so now what we have to do is we have to say, okay, my effective reproduction rate is, I need to place a prior on that. What prior should I choose? Well, you could just say, well, every day the reproduction rate is sampled according to normal distribution. And that might work, but it's not very plausible that you allow for changes, abrupt changes from one day to the next, right? So if you have just um, a whole bunch of normal priors for every day individually and they have nothing to do with each other, well then um, you are saying that it could be that on one day the reduction rate is 2, then it's 0.5, then it's 1.5, and it just like can jump around um, massively. We know that the reproduction rate is not changing all that quickly. It's slowly drifting over time. And in order to inform our model that there is this drifting process, we can place a time-varying random walk process on this. Or we could also place a Gaussian process, but here we're going to use a random walk process, or random walk prior more specifically. And the way this is expressed statistically is that we're saying, okay, our reproduction rate at time t is distributed according to normal distribution, not centered around a fixed value, but rather around the value of the previous day. So this just says, okay, um, the previous date value, say, was 2, with a standard deviation of 1. Well, then it will, the, for the next day, it can move around that range, right? But it can't go to 7 or to minus 2 easily. So it can only stay within that range of the previous value. And this essentially is a smoothing prior, where over time you get this nice drift, which is exactly what we're looking for here. Here I'm just simulating what a random walk looks like. Um, this is the Python code, but yeah, so it's basically this, um, this rope, and that is just informing the model. There is this structure in there, and then it will, the sampler will try and fit that rope in order to best explain the data. Now, what does that model look like? So everything down here is exactly as before. We have our likelihood function. We have our uh, clipping. We have our loop. Um, and now we have the 
RT, or rather the log RT. So we're gonna, um, the Gaussian random walk itself also can go negative. So what we're doing is we are taking the exponent of that so that the RT that we actually get out of that is only can only take on positive values. So basically whenever you have a, something that is based on the real line, so it can be positive and negative, you can just take the exponent of that and then you get just transform it to the positive domain. So fortunately, PyMC3 already has a Gaussian random walk distribution, and you can read up on that. And it has just a sigma parameter, which specifies how quickly is that allowed to change, right? So it's um, how far can we deviate from here, from the previous day's value. And this is going to be very small. And we give it a shape, so the number of data points for every day we want a different value. Then here we apply the exponent. And then, as I said, everything else here is the same. Then I can sample from the prior predictive. And here, well, it doesn't really look all that great in here, but that's just um, the, the way that this is set up. And now I can sample. Uh, this one chain broke um, or, or just hung up. I'm looking here now at the energy trace because uh, here a plot trace function would be really um, messy. Uh, it wouldn't, well, it would be informative, but nonetheless, like this is a, a more a quicker way to assess that. And now I can plot the posterior for my RT process. And this is kind of interesting. So here it says, okay, um, we start out at 1.5 and then very quickly drop to basically zero. Okay, well, let's, that's kind of odd, right? So let's look at this. Um, and um, so we're going to sample from the posterior predictive. Now look at uh, what this looks like. And you can see, actually, so this is a much better model, right? Before we just had exponentials. Now we have, again, basically the exponential process, but we can allow that to change over time. And this allows us to fit this data much better. Still doesn't look like a really great fit, but um, we definitely went in the right direction, right? So now uh, this is definitely by far the best model we have so far. Now what is interesting is now we can start to layer in more things that we know about the spread characteristics of COVID-19. And that one thing that we want to add is infection delay. So what do we so far assume is like on day one, two people are infected and then they move and infect two people the next day and that's it, right? That's not how really how it works. The this person goes um, well goes out right and on and the how infectious that person is changes over time. Um, it follows a certain distribution, but and then also of course how they interact with other people. So um, this is called the generation time distribution, um, which basically models this. Uh, what's the probability of an infected person? infecting another person on the next day, the day after, the day after that. Um, and now here also, I want to demonstrate the power of Bayesian statistics where we can just use our expert knowledge. So there are papers out there that estimate this based on data, and we can just take that. So this particular paper actually provided a closed form solution for a probability function that models the generation time distribution of COVID-19. So we can just take that and now in, include it in our model and get a much more, um, much more plausible model. Now, the way to do that, however, is before we were just like, okay, well, on day T, the number of infectants only depends on the, infectant, the infected patients on day T minus one. But now that's not so simple, right? So on every day, basically, we're saying, well, on day T, it depends on, let's say we're on day eight. Well, then it depends on how many were on day seven, but also this day six, basically all the way back in time. So for every day, we need to sum all previous days and multiply with this function. What that is really is a convolution. Um, so here, basically, now we are adjusting our model and saying, okay, well, we're going to take the previous day's number of infectants, and then we're going to multiply that with 
however many uh, what, what the reproduction rate was before then, right? So we still have our, our E in here. And then we also have our GI, which is the reproduction, uh, the generation time probability on day I. And we do this basically from day one all the way up. So this is the convolution. Um, every day we just sum all previous days and convolute it with our uh, reproduction, uh, with our generation time distribution. Here again, I'm just simulating this to show you how that looks like. Now we have two loops, right? So we need to loop over all previous days. And then here we have our generation time distribution, uh, which I defined above, and the probability density from that. So here you can see now um, what that looks like. And now um, here the code gets a little bit more um, involved. I'm not going to go into too much detail. So here we have the function that creates the generation time interval. And here we have uh, some pretty advanced code uh, that does the pre-computes the convolution. Um, but really, that's it. So um, we just are adding uh, the convolution in here. And um, yeah, like if you, if you want to learn more about that, it's better to look at this um, outside, but just basically to see that the model is pretty much the same. Just in here now, we have another input, which is the convolution ready GT. So we're just passing that in uh, to this loop and multiplying with that in here. So to follow the math above. Okay, so let's estimate that model and analyze the output. And something really interesting happens. So now actually, this looks way more reasonable, right? So early on, we have very fast spread and then it slowly changes over time. So this is that Gaussian random walk posterior distribution, right, that we looked at before. And one thing that I want to highlight here as well is we, of course, are not observing this, right? We can only estimate this um, based on downstream data, but we never actually have this. So this is really the power of Bayesian statistics where we can reason all the way backwards from the observed data to um, through the um, this distribution and down to this uh, unobserved reproduction rate and still get reasonable estimates for this. So this is really amazing, I think, that you can actually do this. Now we're running our posterior predictive, and wow, this looks way better, right? So one thing is that the, um, the previous model just didn't account for, right, is that this is, um, th that the reproduction, it just assumed that the reproduction was very static, right? Every day, just previous day. It's not realistic, and that's why the model didn't explain the data as well. Now we have a data that actually is much more plausible, and we get rewarded for that with just a better estimate of the uh, of the of the data, right? So we can see, okay, well, um, the model explains the data just way better. So we have really a much better model. Now next, I want to just compare those two to prove to myself that this model is actually better, and. From the previous model, I already explained a little bit what the outputs are. So here we want to look at the rank, and then I like to look at the weight. So this just says, okay, well, this model completely blows this other one out of the water. Um, so if I were to combine them, I would only take the previous model because that is just explaining the data um, much better. Okay, so next um, we want to get to the number of infected. So one thing is that um, there is an onset delay distribution. And what that models is that it takes a while for the person who got infected to then get a confirmed positive test, right? So they first have to even develop symptoms, and then they have to get so sick that they actually get to a testing clinic and get a test, and they had a positive result back. So there's another distribution in there that causes further delay. Before, we were just modeling how long does it take for one person to infect another person? Now we have how long does it take for one person to infect another person, and then for that person to actually get a positive test result back. So we have two things here going on, and this other thing is known as the onset distribution. Um, and this is essentially just another convolution. So, um, so now we are convolving both of those together. Um, and here we can better see uh, the convolution that we're doing. So here we're using a 
uh, a Theano function to which does the convolution. I'm not going to go into too much detail. You can just look up the inputs, but basically we just here wrote a wrapper function. Uh, Theano only has a 2D convolution function. Here I just simplified that to basically have a 1D convolution of A and B, or the number of points. And then this is now our model, right? So we again have our random walk. We have the exponential for our seed distribution. We have our loop. Um, and then the output of that loop, right, of the infections, we're just going to add one more thing, right? So we have the infections, and now we say, okay, this is how long it took for person A to infect person B, and now person B will have to become sick and has this other onset distribution of when that person B gets a positive test result. And so now we just layer on, right? So this is really what we've been doing. We start with one simple thing, we layer on the next, we layer on the next, we layer on the next, and now we just layer on this final convolution here, which takes the infections, that delay distribution, and just does another convolution on top of that. So this will just delay and spread this out further. Um, because we know um, the reproduction rate that it would otherwise estimate is actually the reproduction rate of the past. So we have to sort of account for this time delay, otherwise we get biased estimates. And then down here everything is the same. Um, unfortunately, this is a bit anticlimactic. Uh, I mean, there will be a better climax. Uh, but um, so this is the prior predictive uh, you can see, and um, but the the posterior predictive doesn't look right. I actually don't quite know um, why that is the case. I couldn't get it done in time. Uh, I will upload that notebook, and this is basically the exercise for the motivated watcher. Um, take this model and figure out why that didn't quite work. Because here it actually looks fine, right? Um, like the posterior for RT looks fine. Um, but then the reproduction, the posterior predictive doesn't look that great. So um, if you if you figure it out and you send me a solution, I will blast you on Twitter. Um, I'm looking forward to submissions. Um, and then comparing this, uh, the one with the infection delay does explain um, the data better. OK, um, so there's one more thing um, that we can do. And that is, we want to adjust for the number of positive tests. So we know that um, the number of tests that have been admitted was changing over time, right? So it's not that every person got a test. Um, so we started out with very few tests early on, and that means that the that the number of positive tests that we can expect is going to be very limited, right? If you only do ten tests, well, at most you can get test ten positive tests. If you do a million one well, then you expect a much higher number. Um, and we can include that in the model as well, and the final model does that. But I'm not going to show it here. Um, just know that basically this takes that into account as well. So the model, I think, is quite amazing in what it takes into account of what we know. And here is just basically summarizing uh, everything that we've discussed so far. We have the primary infection, and we have the generation time where there's a secondary infection, and then we have an incubation time, which is just while the virus spreads in you and uh, you don't get sick. And then you have the onset time, which is from where you uh, actually get sick to where you get a positive test result, uh, which is modeled by the onset distribution. So, And again, this back here is what we observe. And then we use the knowledge and the model that we built to reason all the way back to here and then estimate the reproduction rate on that. So that is why I think these generative models are so cool, is you really can just think about things intuitively and then build this model and get very complex in how um, how far you go in terms of um, modeling this generative process and how accurate you are and it still actually works to estimate. Um, now here we use the library that uh, is open source, so the model is open source. Um, you can just find it on GitHub. And now here I'm just using that on the most recent data. Um, it's well packaged, and you can just run the sampler. It samples really well. And here again, now we can see basically what the model does. Um, in gray, we have the number of reported positive tests in Massachusetts. So this is basically the data that we're trying to model. Then we adjust for that with the number of ex expected positive tests. So we have a large number. We want to adjust for that, or a small number. Um, and then, so this is basically now walking backwards, right? 
then we have the number of expected um, positive tests if that were if that were constant. Uh, if we would test every day the same, so we essentially normalize across the number of tests admitted, and then from there we go back with our convolutions and our distributions to the expected number of primary infections. So we go from this line to this green line, which is really what we're after, and you can see that it um, basically shifts this back in time because we know that here already people got infected and now um, we're only observing that with uh, a few days later. And for me, this was actually a critical insight. When I now watch the numbers, right, so in Germany uh, we just had 20,000 cases, I know that this is not something that was happening today, but rather the results of like already two weeks ago, there have been people getting infected much more frequently and only now are we seeing this. So the number of infections every day is just um, basically a function of the past behavior. So already like before, there have been these types of um, changes. Um, and then here we just plot it. So this is basically the types of plots that you see on the website. So we get this really nice uh, estimation of the effective reproduction number for Massachusetts. And of course, the valuable thing is here as well, we have the um, uncertainty around that estimate, and that just makes it very possible, uh, the, just very powerful, right? So we want to now want to estimate, well, what is the risk to do, um, the, the pro say, the probability that the number of infections is um, positive? That is very difficult. Well, that's impossible if you only have a, a point estimate, right? Or well, then you have to do some other tricks to uh, back that in. But here, it comes directly out of the model, and we just have this um, yeah, this uh, probability distribution every day, and we can just say what pro what a percent probability mass is above one to estimate uh, how we're doing every day. So I hope this was interesting. Uh, it's definitely much more advanced, but I also wanted to show how you can build extreme powerful models with PyM3. Often in uh, talks or in blog posts, we usually talk about simple models just because those are easier to grok. But this really has caused a mindset shift for me in seeing these very complex models being built and still estimated. And mostly this is possible today because we have a um, really powerful software that allows us to compute the model probabilities and their gradients very quickly. In PyMC3, we use Theano, which then compiles to C. And now we added something also which allows you to um, compile to JAX um, and then run this very quickly on the CPU or GPU or TPU. And then, of course, the other critical component is this new class of samplers based on Hamilton and Monte Carlo. I know they have been around many years, but before those came along, this type of model would have been unthinkable. And But now, really, we didn't have to do anything with the samplers, right? We just wrote the model, and then we hit the inference button, and it just estimates this. And this is just, for me, so incredibly powerful and liberating to be able to build these types of models quickly and just start simple, keep adding things in, and then get something that is just really state of the art and quite amazing. So with that, I wanna conclude and thank you so much for watching. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, if you wanna work with us, PyMC Labs, I'm more than happy to hear from you. Thomas.wiki at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at twiki, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much.